Hey there, it's Tim with the PNT Comps team, and you're listening to episode 51 of Open by Default. As a platform vendor, among other things, Red Hat has always had a unique challenge. What works beautifully on 1 or 10 or 20 machines might break in unexpected ways on 50 or 100 or 1,000. Red Hat has 196 products, depending on who you ask and how you can. If you multiply by certified configurations and use cases, things get pretty weird pretty quick. Fortunately, this is exactly the challenge that the Performance and Scale Engineering Group focuses on. This episode, I'm joined by Will Foster and Gonzarapis. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, fellas. I'd like to start out by inviting you both to introduce yourselves and share a little bit of your Red Hat story so far, starting with you, Gonza. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having us. So just to give you a little bit of uh, insight in what we were doing, or at least me, I was I started as a RevMQE doing automation on Python for, for the RevM testing framework. And then I moved from there to directly to the scale team, scale and performance team to be helping out the guys there with the development of this quad uh, tool that we have now in place for automating the scale up. Nice one. How about you, Will? What's your deal? Hey there. So my name is Will Foster. I've been at Red Hat for a little over 12 and a half years. So I, I started in corporate IT as a sysadmin. Uh, helping to manage the production infrastructure there. Uh, and then I moved on to uh, to manage and lead all the uh, the enterprise storage for Red Hat and did some some work with the Fedora project uh, for a spell. And in 2012, I moved over to engineering to work on OpenStack. Uh, and I was there for a few years. And then that's when we sort of started building up this uh, Scale Lab infrastructure, which originally was just for scale and performance testing of OpenStack. And we had spent so much time working on that that the performance and scale organization just decided to hire us over and move us into that that organization proper. Cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing, guys. So we're here to talk about uh, the performance and scale lab and, and how Red Hat has been doing um, testing of our products at scale to, to see if and how they break. Um, Gonza recommended uh, quads. If you could maybe talk a little bit about that in particular, what is it, um, you know, where did it come from, why did you write it, that kind of thing? Starting, maybe you want to kick us off, Will? Sure. So QUAD stands for Quick and Dirty Scheduler. And originally it started as just a single Python script and a little bit of shell scripts here and there to automate the deployment of large sets of high-performance uh, systems and network gear. Uh, f- in order to sort of become the empowerment vehicle for scale engineers uh, and different folks um, on the product side to te- test and vet our products at scale. So the idea was that, uh, you know, we want to hit and hit problems before customers hit them ideally so that we can fix them to when, you know, a, a big customer has a, a gigantic deployment of something, they're not going to hit something that, that um, you know, causes them issues. Uh, so it originally started uh, purely on the OpenStack side, um, you know, with about 18 to 20 racks of gear. And it had very quickly ramped up and, and grown in footprint, as well as, you know, bringing in all the other products in our portfolio. So, you know, Rail HA and JBoss Middleware and uh, Ansible Tower and um, specific components within OpenStack as well with specific use cases. And so f- uh, the origin story sort of behind quads was that uh, we've always had a very small team of, of, you know, initially two people. And then Gonza was the latest addition to our team last year. Uh, so really three people with, um, you know, upwards of 700 bare metal systems and 30 or 40 high performance switches and, you know, the entire uh, infrastructure and utility services to wrangle along with all of this hardware. And we out of necessity, did not have a way f- for the three of us just to to manage all of this. And so our sort of initial selfish goal was, well, let's automate the things that we would probably screw up uh, in, in Python and, and, and let's Let's, let's automate the things that we don't like doing or things that we might make a mistake in doing that could be potentially disastrous, and let's go from there. And so it, it really became sort of a, a necessity for us just in order to keep up with the workload and the myriad of demands that we have. 
and it's it's blossomed from there into you know a, a proper open source project with you know f- a feature request that people enter from you know around engineering and um, you know it's back end and architectural changes which we'll talk about uh, when we move to the one dot one version which is uh, almost a near rewrite and uh, it's just kind of taken off from there so something that started out of pure necessity you know really to kind of scratch an itch uh, has turned into a fully formed uh, asset scheduler that automates all of our performance and scale uh, shared environments. In that space, I'm kind of familiar with things like Beaker and Jenkins and some of the shared infrastructure offered by PNT DevOps and IT. Can you help me understand how what Quad runs is related to and different from those things? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, B- Quads is, I would say, complementary to Beaker. The Beaker uh, serves a different purpose, uh, and to a certain extent, the rest of sort of the the lab infrastructure that's offered by engineering serves a different purpose as well. So, um, Beaker is a place where you might go and self reserve a set of systems, and you might have that system for one month, or you might have that system for ten years. Uh, it, so it's you know, you're sort of fighting for resources um, based on the current availability. And the, the model that the quads follows is that uh, we, we enter in how we want the, the lab infrastructure uh, to be sliced and diced in the future uh, for an unlimited amount of time as far as we know about. And when the time comes, the gear, uh, so the systems, um, the network switches, the VLANs, the ports, the role-based access, everything uh, spins up and gets reconfigured how we want it to appear and gets automatically validated and handed off to people for short-term duration testing. So our, our sort of our maximum time is about two weeks. And, you know, we, you know, we see a lot of uh, for sort of elastic workloads in that case. And, and really the goal there is that um, we take a very large piece of infrastructure and we can uh, more efficiently slice and dice it up for a short-term usage scenario. So if you think of Beaker sort of like renting an apartment, uh, but Quads is more like an Airbnb. You know, we're very short, defined duration. Um, you know, the the whole spin up and spin down is, is automated. And then one, um, I think one intrinsic difference is that uh, because we also automate the network side of the house, um, we're able to carve out a specific VLAN configuration um, and have complete tenant isolation. Uh, whereas there's some workloads that you might not want to run in Beaker, for example, because it might disrupt your neighbors. You know, any sort of multicast traffic or uh, boot P broadcast traffic like uh, Pixie or DHCP, some of these things are common within the internals of, say, OpenStack. Um, some of these workloads might be disruptive elsewhere, uh, but, you know, with quads, it's sort of aimed towards creating an isolated Airbnb where you have your own little backyard area. And then two weeks later, or maybe a month later, you give that up and someone else moves into it. And is it on the same hardware as Beaker or Beaker is managing a different pool of resources or how to think about that? Right. So it's, it's different hardware. Uh, so the quads runs in, there's two major uh, scale and performance labs uh, within the performance and scale shared lab paradigm, there is Scale Lab, which is based in the RDE2 data center, uh, which is sort of the primary environment we run. And then there's another one in Westford called Alias. And these this is all separated siloed gear uh, because of the the multi-tenancy requirement, because of the isolation requirements of some of the the specific workloads and, and, and application stacks that run there. And, you know, another thing I wanted to point out is that um, the, the Scale Lab and Alias or really anything that Quads manages, at least now, is focused purely on the realm of scalability and performance. So it, it's not really a place where you would go if you needed a couple of machines for a few weeks, but it would be a place to go if, let's say, you're the Ansible Tower group and you're about to release a new version and you need a place to see how it performs across 500 systems. Or you know, you have ha- you've hit a scalability problem early on with say 10 or 12 systems, maybe even in Beaker, and you need a bigger place with a larger runway to sort of vet those issues and hopefully get them fixed before a customer experiences them. So you mentioned the Ansible Tower team. I guess they're like a probably a recent example um, or one that jumps to mind. Can you talk a little bit about the the types of groups that are consuming what um, your team and 
Grand Quads is providing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we, we see uh, requests from pretty much every product group. Uh, and I, I, I guess I use the term product group loosely. I'm, I'm really pertaining to um, the primary engineers of a certain part of one of Red Hat's products. Uh, so, you know, specifically an example might be Fabio Donito and his team that works on the RHEL HA side where, you know, RHEL HA clustering and, and, and things of that, that manner. Um, we see a lot of use from OpenStack still. I would say the the greater OpenStack team, uh, you know, OpenStack's comprised of a dozen or more uh, official components and maybe a million other unofficial components. Uh, but we see probably half the lab, maybe 45% of it, the requests are coming from the OpenStack group. And that that's um, it, there's an interesting level of granularity with something like an infrastructure as a service platform like OpenStack, because we might only see for a week or two just software-defined networking. Uh, workloads. And these might be heavily delved in the telco space, for example. And then the next week we might see just pure Nova compute. And so not only do we see, you know, like the, 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 the product proper, but we also see the sort of modular components within uh, a product get run. Um, we have a big space as well for the storage groups. So that'd be the Ceph team, the Gluster team, and the, the Ceph team has uh, a few sort of longer running assignments as well. And they're, they're regular uh, tenants in, in our scale environments. It sounds like most, if not all of the product groups are consuming what you guys are offering, what the, what the labs offer, at least at some point in, the, in their life cycle. Is that correct? Not as much as we'd like. Uh, so I, I think the awareness is not where we'd like to have it simply because the scale initiative is really officially only about a year or two old. And, you know, life at Red Hat is oftentimes beautifully chaotic and, and you don't always know what services are offered uh, as an engineer or as a, as a product manager um, that are right at your fingertips if you the right person just told you about it. Sure, that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the smarts that you guys have kind of put into uh, the software that makes all this this possible and maybe you can talk a little bit about um, you know you said it started with the Python script and grew from there and I, I understand that uh, recently you guys did a pretty big release of the of the project and um, as you said before now it's available and uh, has developed some interest in, in, in an, uh, a kind of upstream. So kind of talk about um, the getting from the, the, per, the, the Python script you started with to the release you just did. You know, how, how did you look at making those improvements? Um, how did you prioritize them? How did you trade that off against the more like admin system and work that you had to do and things like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think I, I want to cover sort of the, the beginnings of it very briefly. You know, we I, I think we would be amiss if we didn't mention the Foreman project. Uh, we're really big fans of the of Foreman, um, you know, which is the the upstream version of Red Hat Satellite, which, which pulls in quite a bit of our subscription revenue. It's a substantial uh, project is very important. And just as sort of systems engineers, as sysadmins, we've always liked Foreman and we've, we've used it for, you know, maybe going on a decade since it was in its early infancy um, to basically ease the burden of systems administration. And so the early versions of quads were basically just reaching out to Foreman in order to trigger uh, provisioning to happen at a certain time. And then we realized that the network level changes were something that, um, you know, everybody, it's exciting the first time you configure a set of VLANs, uh, you know, say on a Juniper switch or a Cisco switch, but very few people really want to do that all day, all the time. And we weren't interested in, in also becoming network engineers, uh, but we also realized that there's a whole lot of potential possi possibilities for calamity if you were to mistype a VLAN or down the wrong port. And so the first sort of moving target after we had um, sort of automated some things that call out to Foreman is, well, let's automate the network piece. Uh, let's, we, we know that our changes are 
um, that we, we know what our change sets are going to look like and, and we know what the intended state of our, our different networks are going to look like on a certain day in the future. So let's just automate that. And so then we started to, and that's really where, when quad started to become its own uh, manifestation. Um, the fact that it did the, the network administration and it did the, the VLAN port changes and it basically provided that um, architectural layer of tenant isolation at the network layer at the top of rack switch. Um, you know, for, for the different systems. And so it's sort of built from there in that, um, well, the next thing that we, we missed was um, we need some way to accurately describe our infrastructure at any point in time. And I, I, I don't ever want to have to edit a spreadsheet to keep infrastructure documentation in there. No one's going to do it. People are going to forget or make a mistake. And, you know, incorrect documentation is probably worse than, than no documentation. Uh, because again, you open yourself up to um, making mistakes and and possibly affecting um, critical workloads and things like that. So the other sort of pillar in quads was that let's let's first let's automate the network piece. We've already got the systems automation down by relying on a system like Foreman, uh, and let's automate all the documentation. So all of the current state of the environment is is regenerated automatically. So you can sort of at a glance, anybody within the company can look into the scale lab or any environment that runs quads and say, okay, here, here are the, the, the groups that are doing, uh, that are using the systems. What, what systems are they using? How long are they going to have those systems? Um, what, which systems do they have and what systems are free that I'm, I might be able to request. So we thought that that sort of functionality was critical to, um, you know, getting bigger, more adoption of, of the project and, and, and also giving that transparency to engineers to where there's no, there's no hood over the machine. You know, there's, um, it's no longer, we wanted to get out of the game of every department, every engineering department budgeted their own hardware somewhere. Um, oftentimes at different, at different intervals, uh, you know, the, the hardware depreciation cycles don't match and you end up having these isolated pockets of expensive hardware spread across the com- the company uh, and, and really the way forward here and, and sort of the, the impetus from quads was, well, let's just have one big pile of hardware, but let's have sort of an intelligent future way to schedule who gets that hardware. And then let's make it transparent for people to see exactly what's going on, um, both, you know, in, in, in the past currently right now and in the future. So can I just ask a question? Well, you were talking, it kind of started to become more obvious to me that one of the things that makes this hard, the pool of hardware you're talking about unique is that is more unique kind of exotic than just, for example, a bunch of x86 and kind of throw away SSDs and things like that. It's like kind of more esoteric right. yeah, that's hardware. A, an astute observation. So it's something that we probably should have mentioned is, is really the, there is intrinsic differences between the hardware that we would have in the scale lab and other places in the company. It is very heterogeneous uh, in that um, we have 12 different system types uh, across two vendors right now, Dell and Supermicro, but there's 12 different server types. And, and we, we try to represent uh, sort of a, a um, built for purpose spec and have enough of these types of built for purpose spec machines to satisfy common workloads. So you sure you'll see your standard sort of compute node um, spec in there, you know, your Dell R630s, your uh, Supermicro 1029Ps. Uh, but what you also see is some storage class machines, um, you know, with, with a, a 36 plus internal disks um, that, you know, is going to be the, the choice for customers that are running Ceph or Gluster workloads or any sort of uh, storage defined networking workloads. And then you have um, larger class machines that are going to be make for better OpenStack controllers or going to make for better container hosts. And so across the 12 machine types, we have a very rigid level of consistency and that each model has to be the exact same, but we have 12 different models uh, and sort of the general archetype of all these systems and what they have in common, which is different from other environments in Red Hat is that this is all high performance gear that the, the, the small, the, the, the slowest link speed that you're going to find is 10 gig, but you're also going to find systems with quad 40 gig interfaces, for example. And you know every every top rack switches at 100 gig, so it's it's going to it's going to be 100 across the board 
uh, high throughput networking and the system types are going to be sort of spec'd for high performance scale workloads. Um, whereas we might not have as many of them if you, you know, tally up all the systems that are in Beaker, but of course, Beaker is going to have that variety. Um, you know, there's, you know, non-Intel based, you know, non-X86 based hardware in Beaker um, that, that that's just a, a different, that's a different use case. Uh, if, if you were developing, if you're doing kernel work and you needed um, S390 or, you know, you needed um, some other architecture besides X86, well, that's the place for you. Uh, but if you were doing very targeted high performance workloads and um, with the specific needs that different application stacks needed, mainly cloud stacks, then Scale Lab would be where you would want to go because across that heterogeneous environment, we have 12 different system types um, that are all sort of fit for purpose for a particular function. That makes sense. So maybe Gonza can talk a bit about the way you guys kind of tackled the problem of uh, the growth you were seeing in demand, both usage demand, and then I guess the growth in actual uh, assets under management and how you kind of square that up against uh, the limited resources you, you have to deliver something that's going to going to enable the type of performance you're testing about over the next I don't know how long how long you expect what you've got now to last for but uh, talk about how you guys thought that thought through that the changes you had to made and and planned it out and actually executed to get where you got to yeah as as you said like uh, one of the our main concerns that we had at at a point was uh, how how can we scale these uh, these uh, assignments? Like how can we have more servers and how can we offer more uh, like bigger uh, assignments, bigger loads to to our customers or like uh, the people that will be using the servers? And I think a big uh, a big thing for us was to be able to do all the provisioning asynchronously, since like. Right now, we, as, as we mentioned before, we have about 700 servers. So with uh, the restriction that we have of being able to take uh, on those assignments for at least two weeks, that means that at least every two weeks, we have a host moving from one assignment to the other. And therefore, uh, it could happen that one day uh, we have at least all 700 servers from uh, from the scale lab moving into assignments for people to use them. So uh, what we had before and what we were doing with the 1.0 code was that uh, all the all the provisioning and all the all the rollouts of these assignments were done synchronously on at a sort of like script in sysadmin fashion so one big important step for us to make in the evolution of quads was to this move to python 3 first and foremost because of the actual uh, python 2.7 retirement that's happening in just less than three months i think it's like two months and, and two weeks now and so a big important piece on on the improvements for the quads one one code was this move to Python three, and at the same time we got for free, let's say, uh, included on the on the Python three uh, package that we got the async IO library. So we decided that we could make a really good use of of this async IO functionality in in our provisioning uh, workflow, at least the quads provisioning workflow. And it, it's been actually quite a journey, let's say. And we now have uh, some really good results on, on our provisioning times. And just to give you a picture, for example, like uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, like if you would have like those 700 servers moving to an assignment, uh, this normally happens on a Sunday night around 10 p.m. It, it might have happened in, in, in previous points, like in, in the one we had the 1.0 code that uh, we would 
come to to work on a Monday morning, expecting that all those hosts have been already provisioned and already moved, and and that there were no issues with the provisioning. So, like we we were we would actually expect uh, all those all those moves to occur, but with a large assignment, uh, we could like a move could take up to eighteen hours in the past for for moving all those hosts synchronously so now we we managed to reduce that time to about six hours which this translates directly in the fact that uh, when we get to work on a monday morning all assignments should have already rolled out and we would only have to deal with any any issues that might have arose on the on the on the actual move like let's say a misconfiguration of the switch or or whatnot so that was uh, one of the biggest enhancements that we actually strive for in order to to make it more scalable in order to handle bigger loads Something something you said a couple times is that um, the quads was or- originally kind of came together in a very sysadmin manner. Um, and I feel like there's like an unspoken thing that um, the newer version is, is kind of modeled a different way or follows a different type of approach can you can you call out what the uh, the thing you're contrasting it against is like if the earlier version was very sysadmin-y then the newer version is more like what right that's a good question yeah so essentially i think uh quats began in a or like it, it grew in a very organic manner and as as we'll mention before as well, it it was mostly about automating the workload that we have for the, that we had for the scale lab. Yeah, basically, almost all these these changes that that we made were to convert the quads uh, the quads functionality into a more programmatically and more flexible in terms of development let's say that's that's what i what i sort of mentioned before in in terms of on a csat meaning way that that now it's it's more of uh let's say it's more development wise i would say kind of reflecting the change of priority from we need these scripts and things to make our day jobs easier to now our day jobs are these scripts and things and we need to make that job easier so that the priority kind of came more about how can you maintain this how can you add new stuff to it over time how can you evolve it rather than meeting the immediate need of like i don't want to have to reconfigure this vlan ever again yeah so even every other change that we make uh, nowadays it's we look on on how uh, is it going to scale and and how are we how is it going to help us in the future as well? So, yeah, that's it. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you guys have learned um, as you've, as you've been, this priority shift has been going on? We scrambled to find the time to start the automation. And, you know, I think we're now we're, we're at a point that the automation is so much of, uh, it's such a large part of, all of the orchestration and the running of the shared environments that we, you know, ideally want to spend 70% continuing to build and improve the automation and 30% actually doing the sysadmin and network stuff. And, um, you know, part, part of that, um, part of those enhancements of the provisioning time due through the asynchronicity of, uh, Async.io and some of the sort of the core foundational architectural improvements that Gonza talked about, um, you know, you, you can you can never automate away hardware failures. And when you have 700 systems, um, you're going to almost always have hardware failures at different times. But with a, a much 
faster, more robust, and easier to maintain orchestration framework, um, you can basically just have a, a level of um, acceptable failure. And if the the orchestration is fast enough, you don't necessarily need to worry that you know one system didn't come up, or you know the CPU went away, or you you know you lost two disks or whatever on a system. Um, for you can very quickly swap that system out with a brand new system that's free, and the individual servers become less important. Uh, so that was one of the the major things that we we had learned and, and tried to strive towards is. The individual systems aren't important. It's the it's the overall infrastructure and how fast can we can we what is our our malleability in terms of failure? Like uh, we want to strive to a model that um, there's always some acceptable threshold of error. And and one of the things we we had learned early on is um, we had to have really good validations that run on the hardware before we hand these sets of systems out to people. Um, the, the, the amount of time and effort lost and, you know, people getting mad at us because they get, you know, 50 machines and, and three of them don't come up right. Um, you know, that that takes time, especially if you're you're working in a distributed environment and people are in different time zones. You know, the last thing you want to do is be going back and forth on email with someone across the world about a system or two that they needed to get their whole workload deployed because they need exactly this many systems. So uh, one of the things we learned early on was um, we needed to implement every manner of validation check on this hardware and the network um, before we flag the system as being ready to use. Uh, and so that's always been a learning process. We're always coming up with uh, and coming into gaps where we didn't have coverage. And so we, we have really learned a lot in terms of, of, of the importance of having um, good coverage and validation of hardware before people get them and validation of the networks before they get them. Um, the other one too um, is it, like when you, when you're writing a software, when you're maintaining a software project and, and adding features, um, people never use it the way that you think they're going to use it. Um, not everyone's going to use it the way that you use it, for example. And so it sort of opened our eyes as far as um, how people are using the software or the features that they might want that we never thought of. So, you know, we, we had learned early on that that having, you know, all the stuff up on GitHub and, and encouraging people to open feature requests and, and having, you know, like an open call every two weeks where people can request, um, you know, here's what I'm trying to do. It would be cool if quads could do this. Um, that's sort of opened our eyes that, that you're never going to account for every use case of something. Um, but, you know, you can try really hard and hopefully get most of them. I also heard something in the first part of your response about um, for maybe there's a process of going from like you're trying to keep up something, keep up and running something that's pretty cool and um, it's hard to do. So it's kind of like, not that I'm, I don't think you would say this or even really say this, but it's kind of like you went from being like, 50 out of 53 servers ain't bad. Like, what do you complain about to like having reached a certain level of expectations with the, the users of the service um, that you're providing where the, the project had to kind of build in these quality of it, like a customer experience kind of elements that you didn't really have to have as a priority before? Yeah, I think that's a that's an accurate um, observation of sort of of the evolution of it the, having a greater adoption and getting more users is that, you know, what we don't want to have happen is people might only need, say, 50 servers for a specific workload or a test, and they always request 60 uh, because they are, are, are conditioned that, well, I don't always ever get the 50 servers I asked for because there's always something wrong with one or two. So we, we, we also, we, we sort of get off on, on like seeing a flawless delivery of systems, especially at a high count. Um, you know, when we have assignments go out over a hundred nodes and, you know, a hundred nodes, that's over 400 VLAN changes. That's, that's, um, over, that's a hundred IPMI credential changes. That's, that's, Four, 450 role-based access API calls to Foreman, and then that's ultimately 400 kickstarts and, and ping tests and all manner of validation. When we see something at a high count go out and there's a 100% success rate, we love that. When you Before you were talking about one of the things you'd like to see is increased usage of the environment and the, and the project. And I'm wondering, you know, what does that 
what does that actually look like like to you is that more quests coming in um more jobs being run and then in addition to more adoption whatever however you define that um what else what other support uh could could somebody listening to this render you in the team I think we'd love to see more of a variety in, in the requests that we get. Um, I, I think it's partly our fault that, that, you know, w- we haven't really had a good platform or, or like a good um, consistent way to sort of tell people about the scale lab, especially people that have joined the company in the last year um, that, you know, the people that already know about it are usually the ones that routinely submit things. And we have seen an uptick in new requests, but I think first and foremost, we just love for people to know that it exists know that uh, the perf and, perf and scale um, engineering has shared labs that, that specifically are the place to go if you have a scalar performance issue or if your customer has a scalar performance issue and and really just get the word out there that, that we want to see those requests come in. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I, th- I think that, that we we're just looking for um, feature requests for people to put in. If, if, if there's it, you know, take it, take a shot, put in, put in a request for the scale lab and, and see, tell us about your experiences. And, and if there's things that, that aren't there that you'd like to see, we want to know about it. Uh, and then obviously we, we, we love, we love uh, patches and we love developer contributions as well. So guys, I want to thank you a lot for uh, coming to talk to me today. I really appreciate your time and uh, talking me through all this. Well, thank you, Tim, for having us. Uh, it's it's been a great opportunity, and, and we appreciate the platform, and and we appreciate the good questions you've asked. Those are uh, it's a good dialogue. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you learned something from this episode, please go ahead and smash that like button. If you got any questions, please leave them as a comment on the post. Until next time. Bye.